kick the tires, light the fires. It's time to get this bad boy in the air. It's time for Ask the Captain. First question on Ask the Captain. RD200T, assume a clear weather day and a technological proficient passenger with no flight training. How many do you think could land a plane if guided by instructors over the radio? I'm, I'm trying not to be dogmatic about this. There's tons of videos out there, uh, certainly in the aviation space of a guy trying to talk a civilian down, even just in the simulator. It doesn't end well. It's really Hollywood movie magic that kind of makes it work out okay. But in the real world, it's not a thing. Now, I wish you all the best. If you're that person and you are the first civilian to land an airplane with no expertise at all, I want to write the foreword for your book because I want to get in on that book deal. All right, just give me 5%. That's all I want. But I, it's not, yeah, okay. Ready to go. All right, it's Chuck MC3704. Why does the plane sometimes feel like it's sinking about a minute into takeoff? Uh, is it uh, the power adjustment? I did some short videos on this a while back, and <coughs> it's because I'm retracting the flaps. Now, sometimes it's because I've got what's called a noise abatement procedure. Um, some high density areas where rich people live, um, they'll make a fuss, and when you they want you to take off at a certain steep angle and then once you kind of get over their houses they want you to pull the power back you're in no peril at all when i do get to that point in the climb where i begin to retract the flaps the power goes from takeoff power to climb power which is a reduced power setting so you hear it first you feel it a little bit in your seat you're not pushed back as much in your seat and the nose starts to come over at the same time i'm beginning to retract the flaps and the airplane settles a little bit Ooh, that's an uncomfortable feeling in the back of the airplane because you're thinking how far is this going to go it isn't it's just because i'm actually accelerating that it's a it's a weird sensation you think you're dropping you're actually accelerating that's what's going on that's that's the good news all right adam uh, uh, Corbetto, I'll be flying from London to Florida. Uh, what happens if there's an issue mid-flight right over the middle of the Atlantic when, when there's nothing else nearby? Well, we train for that all the time. We're on what's called the tracks when we come over the North Atlantic, and those tracks are assigned to different aircraft to keep them separated from each other and their separation in front of you and behind you and, and altitude separation. Um, the, the middle of the North Atlantic is at 30 West, and that's where we switch over from one oceanic controller to the next oceanic controller. That's typically about as far as you're gonna be from land at that point. Some of those tracks go way up north around by Iceland and Greenland. So you've got diverts that you can go to there. You've got Scotland that you can turn back to or Ireland. And then you've got the Maritimes, uh, Newfoundland on the other side of the Atlantic. So you're never more than two hours at the most from a suitable alternate. If you've got a southerly track away from those airports, Lodges in the Azores is never really more than two hours away. But we're always kind of checking our fuel, checking our systems. That's what I'm doing up there when we're in the, the slow part of the flight. I'm always looking at my alternate, what's the weather? If I had to go, how would I get there in the most efficient manner? That's all part of our training. So sit back, relax, and enjoy your Diet Coke. You'll be just fine. All right. That's an awesome question. I've got Judd uh, S5643. After a very firm landing, not a Captain Steve landing, clearly. After a very firm landing, I waited to deplane, stuck my head in the cockpit and said, oh, here it comes. Which one of you is ex-Navy? Oh, oh my word. I almost don't want to read the rest of this question. The captain pointed to the first officer and we both smiled. He knew exactly what I meant. All right, Jude. As a former Navy pilot, it's it's bad. It's it's frightfully bad form, old chap, to assume that all of our landings are firm. Now, the carrier guys that flew jets, yeah, they had firm landings for obvious reasons on the deck of the carrier. Are they capable of making a smooth landing? I assume so. I was a P3 guy in the Navy, all right? I was land-based the whole time, right? Smooth landings, it's all about it. But you know what? Honestly, 
all kidding aside between Air Force and Navy, a safe landing is the one uh, that you want. And it's not always the smoothest landing that is the safest landing. Let me explain. If you hold off the airplane to get a smooth squeaker and you fly halfway down that runway and you use up all your available runway to get that squeaker on the runway, that's not a safe landing. You want to get it down in the first third of the runway so that you have plenty of room to stop that airplane. Places like LaGuardia that have shortened runways, you might want to get it down even sooner than that first third. So that's why sometimes you get a little more firm landing. The bottom line is any landing you walk away from, it's a good landing. Mm. Boy, that was rude. All right, <laughs> simply base 13. Do pilots ever get mad if another pilot cuts them off midair or while taxiing, uh, similar to road rage? That just never happens. You're always, uh, there's always people controlling you. And, uh, you, you know, now if somebody did cut in front of me and they weren't talking to anybody, yeah, I wouldn't get mad about it, but I'd want to know why that happened. Um, and it was a couple times over a 40 year career that something close to that has happened. And I keyed the mic and said, Hey, what, what just happened just now? But it's, it's very rare. It's so rare that it's not even worth talking about. All right. Uh, we've got WMXX 2000. Uh, how do you practice for pilot incapacitation in a training simulator? Oh, this is a good one. Does the instructor just tap one of the pilots on the shoulder and say, Hey, keel over? Yes. In fact, it's very close to that. So on my last training, I'm a captain. I was with my first officer. Uh, we spent three days together in the simulator. Uh, on the second day in the simulator, we went for our little um, you know, snack break in between. We came back for our last two hours in the simulator. And the instructor leaned over to me and said, hey, Steve, when you get back in the seat, he said, we're going to get rolling down the runway. He said, just, just don't do anything. Just sit there like you're incapacitated. And I said, okay, got it, right? So it was the, the first officer's takeoff. I'm supposed to do certain things during the takeoff roll. Like at 80 knots, I'm supposed to say 80. And then we do a check. And the, the other pilot says check. And at, uh, at V1, the computer says V1, but at, at rotate, I say rotate. So at 80 knots, I did my 80 knot check. And then I just did one of these. I sat over there and went like that. Now, she didn't see it. She's looking out front, right? But I'm I'm playing up the part uh, like that. And so we get to rotate and I'm not, she's not here in rotate. She's still on the runway. She looks over at me and sees me and goes, oh, pulls the airplane off, right? Right thing, rotates the airplane. Um, it says, are you okay? And I, I, don't, I don't say anything. She grabs the gear and raises it and starts going through the motions of I, my aircraft. I got it, you know, and, and getting me the help I need. We all had a good laugh after that, but it's great training. It really is great training, especially when you're not expecting it to happen. That's an awesome question. All right. Um, Spell Daddy 5386. What was the craziest and most challenging scenario a simulator instructor ever threw at you during training? Probably the hardest one I ever went through was we were doing a category three approach, which is, which is an auto land. The weather was basically zero, zero in San Francisco. We got all the way down to close to touching down and the instructor called a go around from the tower we were going around in this what we call the goo we we're going around in the goo and he failed an engine on us in that scenario and the airplane wants to lurch and everything else you don't have any visual references uh it was quite challenging i, I would say and i'm just going to leave it at that that was probably the most challenging scenario um, i've ever um, flown through did i do a great job with it well i'm still flying let's put it that way okay uh, the training sometimes is needed. Keeping it simple, which aircraft from the past, famous or not, would you most like to have flown and why? I think the SR-71, uh, it's just a cool looking airplane, great mission, goes really fast. Um, I would like to know what those guys do. I mean, they see the, the edge of outer space, they're in space suits. Yeah, absolutely, the SR-71. If you don't know anything about the SR-71, look it up. Uh, they don't fly them anymore, but but man, what a what a great airplane that would have been to fly. Team Done Racing. Uh, a friend flies high performance aerobatic planes, but for the sheer joy of flying, he flies a 1940s J3 Cub. Do you have a just for fun aircraft? I do own my own aircraft. It's called a Long Easy. Uh, and it's a fun airplane to fly. It's a Burt Rattan designed airplane. If you've ever seen one, you noticed it, you remembered it because it's got this futuristic spaceship looking design. It's tandem seating. That means pilot in the front, passenger in the back. It's got a little side stick. The engine is at the back of the airplane and it, so it's a pusher. 
and it's got wings and a little canard in the front for lift. It's just a cool looking little airplane and it's a hot rod. The thing goes 165 miles an hour true airspeed and I, I love flying that airplane. Yep. Great question. Thanks for asking. 360 guy one writes uh, back in the 80s and 90s. United had a channel where you could listen to the cockpit communications with ATC. Any idea why this disappeared? In a word, attorneys. There you go. That's the answer. Uh, Day Z May, <laughs> can you explain the process of dumping fuel? When and where can you do this? And what is the environment environmental impact for uh, atorized or air aerosolized fuel? Uh, the, uh, there are some parameters around dumping fuel. Now in an emergency, if you had to, to save the life of your passengers, you can dump at any time. Ideally you do it above 5,000 feet of altitude because the fuel will atomize and it won't make it all the way down to the ground. Uh, I know some of you are going to say, yeah, it does. I, that, again, these are all just general parameters that they're the, those are the parameters I'm given as a pilot. I don't know the science behind them all. I know we want to try above 5,000 feet. Ideally, you would do it offshore someplace. Um, dumping fuel just depends on how much in the dump rate of your aircraft. But typically speaking, if I need to get rid of 30 or 40,000 pounds of gas in my airplane, it's probably going to take me 20 to 25 minutes um, to do that. I only do that if the overweight landing is more perilous than dumping the fuel. I've never dumped fuel. Um, you know, I did it once in the Navy. Once in the Navy, that's it. Never at the airlines. Let me see, uh, the Wanderer, the Wanderer, hmm. Would it be possible to live stream all of the flight data from the black boxes to a cloud server? This could be useful if the recorders can't be recovered. I, other than um, MH370, that Malaysian airliner that still has disappeared, I don't know that they've never had a black box that they couldn't recover. Now, there's probably some, trust me, I, I don't have the memory banks on this for sure that they've never recovered. Uh, could they live stream all that? Yeah, I suppose so. I don't know if there's that big a need um, to do it. How about building a black box recorder that jettisons on impact and floats? How about that? They have the technology for it. They would put it up in the tail of the airplane high enough because that's generally speaking the last thing to hit when there's an impact. And if it was in water, based on so many G's, it would deploy and then it would float and then you could find where the aircraft is. We would know where MH370 is today if they had had that technology. That's what I'm in favor of doing. All right, we've got uh, Joshua uh, Cat 8147. Why isn't the APU, that's the auxiliary power unit, configured to provide electrical and hydraulic power in a dual engine failure? Wouldn't it be more powerful than the RAT? In fact, the APU does fire up in a dual engine failure. Uh, one of the things that you can read in the report from the AAIB is how long it took the APU to fire up. But when once it gets a signal, it takes about 30 to 45 seconds for the APU to fire up and to provide useful uh, electricity and hydraulic pressure. It's just, it's a jet engine and it's got to fire off and it's got to spool up. So the APU door opened, it started its sequence to light off. I don't know that it completely lit off by the time um, that they got to that, but the rat is the instantaneous. It comes out right away. It gives you within two or three seconds, uh, electrical and hydraulic power while the APU is coming up online. But ideally you're right. The APU would be even better than the rat. Okay. I've got, uh, uh, Get Dusty One uh, writes this: Why haven't engineers hooked up motors to get the wheels spinning at landing speed uh, to lengthen the life of the tires? Each tire on my airplane, the Boeing Triple Seven, costs seven or six thousand dollars a piece. They're pretty expensive. They're amazing tires. They go from zero to 150 miles an hour just like that when they touch down. They're very reliable. Uh, in my 34 year career with the airlines. I've never had a tire come apart uh, on landing and I've had some firm landings over the years. I'll admit it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't think the, it would be extra weight on the airplane and extra bulk back there to design something that caused the tires to spin up. And again, it's just one more thing to kind of break on the airplane and we don't need any more delays. Really no need for it. Last question. All right. The real Fitch. When the pilot comes on the PA and announces how long the flight is going to be, is that timed from door closing, pushback, 
or the moment the plane is airborne. The, you're, you've got it right. There's basically three different times we can give you. The total length that the flight is budgeted for, which is from the time the door closes uh, to the time we get to the other door at the other gate. There is wheels up to wheels down time, which doesn't include the taxi time. And then there's probably one other variation of that theme in there. I always give people wheels up to wheels down time. I don't know. I just like saying wheels up to wheels down just sounds cool as a pilot. Um, but you do have to add to that a few minutes for taxiing. I will usually tell my passengers and add to that a few minutes to taxi in at London or wherever we're going. Most of the time, once you get off the runway, it's pretty quick to the gate, unless of course your gate is occupied, in which case it's a good thing we have those electronic devices to keep us entertained in the back of the airplane. All right, folks, great questions today. Um, keep them coming in the comments. I love uh, answering your questions out there as much as you love asking them. This has been Ask the Captain. I'm Captain Steve. We'll see you next time.